Thank you all for joining us today. Um, this afternoon we have Dr. McAllister who is with us who's going to be talking through a little bit about the advances in spine treatments and care here at Riverside. So Dr. McAllister, thank you for joining. I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to you. Okay, thank you. So my name is Dr. William McAllister. I'm a neurosurgeon here uh, at Riverside, one of four, myself, uh, Dr. Jack Salvin, Dr. Dean Kostoff, Dr. Javier Amadeo. We are the main practitioners of spinal surgery here at Riverside. Um, and uh, so we do, we do all the surgeries and see a good many of the patients. Um, and I've been here at Riverside since 2002, practicing spine surgery and neurosurgery in general. But when you're a neurosurgeon in the community like I am and like my partners are, the bulk of our practice is spine surgery. Probably two thirds of what we do is related to spine care and the other third is related to the, to the brain and other parts of the nervous system. But spine care is, is where we spend most of our time, particularly in the office setting. Um, it's the bulk of patients we see. Spine care is an interesting uh, phenomenon because it involves both parts of the musculoskeletal system, the spinal column, uh, which is obviously made up of all the various vertebrae, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, the discs, um, the muscles that encase our spine from top to bottom, uh, and then obviously the spinal cord and the nerves. So um, we, we get to sort of operate uh, in and out of that part of the body all the time, both cervical spine, thoracic spine around your rib and lumbar spine. Um, obviously low back pain and lumbar spine is what most people worry about because it's the most common condition or second most common condition for which people routinely seek medical care. If you look at emergency rooms, private, uh, private practitioners like family doctors, uh, that's the second most common reason that people are showing up and seeking care. So it's something that affects almost all adults at some point in their life, some once or twice, some on recurrent occasions. And so there's a huge need to sort of understand better what's going on and offer effective treatments that allow people to, you know, get rid of the pain or whatever it is that's bothering them and then also allowing them to return to work or whatever activities uh, they, they were doing. So. Uh, we're always interested in, in trying to push uh, what, what's known, staying up to date, uh, and reading journals, going to meetings. And then here at Riverside, we've been fortunate enough to, because of the hospital's commitment to neurosciences, uh, have a lot of equipment in the operating room that helps us be more efficient as surgeons. And since I'm a surgeon, that's what I'll primarily talk about. So. Um, we, we obviously do a fair bit of spinal surgery. Uh, we, don't, we don't try to do it, but it just, there's a lot of spinal conditions that are improved with surgery. And, and when that's the case, that's when we do it. We certainly don't operate on everyone with back pain or even everybody with a herniated disc or anything like that. But a, a fair number of people with those problems will ultimately come to a point in their life when they'll need to consider surgery as an option. And sometimes surgery is, in fact, a better option. People often say in the office, well, I want surgery to be my last option, and that's fine. But for some people, if they want to get back to work fast and they want to end whatever symptoms they're having, whether it be pain, weakness, or numbness, or all, of, all three of those, surgery is sometimes for them the best option. Um, there are a lot of advances that have come about in spine surgery uh, in the last, well, ongoing. Um, more recently, we've um, started to incorporate principles of, of uh, fast recovery after surgery, uh, which uh, include, you know, simple common sense things, but things that surgeons actually weren't routinely doing. Um, the, the opioid epidemic really made uh, surgeons, and particularly spine surgeons, rethink how we were treating patients before surgery and after surgery, because obviously pain is a big part of spine problems. And um, for the first you know, 10 to 15 years of me, for my practice, that was sort of a common thing was to prescribe a fair amount of those types of medicines. But uh, what the one thing that the opioid epidemic has taught us is that sometimes those types of medications aren't um, in people's best interest long term because of the potential for uh, tolerance and addiction. So uh, more recently here at Riverside, we've been doing a lot of um, treatment where we try to minimize the amount of uh, narcotic prescriptions, both combining techniques that the anesthesiologists use preoperatively, both in the operating room and then as well as postoperatively, where we're using uh, medicines that previously weren't routinely used for pain after surgery, and we're trying to substitute those. And we find that's helpful because, one, it helps people not get the side effects of narcotics, of which can be uh, nausea, vomiting, 
um, you know, constipation, things like that that can really set you back. And if we limit how much of those medicines we give people both before and after surgery, we find that overall their pain levels don't really change that much, but a lot of the complications that those medicines create, both short-term and as well as the unfortunate long-term ones, are, are minimized. So we've been doing that for about a year to a year and a half now, um, and we found a, a great deal of success. Um, it used to be that we would have people, particularly if we were doing surgeries where we're fusing vertebrae together, where for the first day after surgery, the patient would just come to the floor and would just lay in bed, and we don't do that anymore. We we give them, you know, simple things like giving them round-the-clock Tylenol dosing where they're just getting Tylenol even if they're not asking it, using other types of medications that are given on a scheduled interval that aren't narcotics but do help to seem limit, limit post-operative pain, and then having the physical therapists and nurses get these patients up almost from the minute they get to the, to the floor uh, so that they're, they're not getting blood pooling in their legs, their gastrointestinal system, their stomach is challenged, they were feeding them right away. So we're, and we're getting people out of the hospital faster. And one of the nice things about getting people out of the hospital faster is that there's clearly a correlation between the longer you stay in the hospital and the higher the risk of some post-operative complications such as infection and blood clots in the legs. And so by getting people up and going, while it may seem counterintuitive after you've operated on something as delicate as the spine to be doing that, it actually serves people's interests pretty well. And so people are coming in and surgeries that normally were, well, not normally, but were previously t keeping them in the hospital two and three nights and three and four days. People are going home the next day and we're using home nursing more. So nurses are, and, and th therapists are coming out to the house and some of the simple things that we used to do, like keeping people, like sometimes we use drains after surgery because there can be some bleeding that we don't want to accumulate underneath the incision. And, um, you know, it was pretty routine four or five years ago to just keep people in the hospital until the drain was ready to be removed. Now we're sending people home with the drains, teaching them either one, how to take them out, or having uh, home health aides come out to the house and do it. And so people that were in the hospital for no other reason other than to just watch what was coming out of the drain or doing the same thing at home, having none, no untoward side effect from that and actually doing quite well with that. Because when you're at home, again, you're, you're, in, you're actually, in some respects, in a cleaner environment. At least you're in an environment where your bacteria that your body sort of has are already there. You're not in a place where there's bacteria that your body isn't accustomed to. So we get people out. And the other thing about sending people home is they actually have to then get up and do more for themselves. And there's nothing better for you after spine surgery uh, than to be up and mobile and moving and walking, um, laying in a bed, um, not being you know, ambulatory is uh, detrimental. It leads to getting blood clots in the legs and things like that. So that's one of the more simple things that we recently started doing, which we found success with. And we think that pa patients are happier being at home than they are in the hospital. Um, they get the food they like and they sleep in a bed they like and they have a TV set that has all their channels and it's quieter. Um, and then one of the things we've had at Riverside for a while and we continue to um, uh, perfect is the use of what's called intraoperative imaging. We have two devices that are essentially CAT scanners that are mobile uh, that allow us to uh, both uh, do CAT scans before and after surgeries, particularly surgeries where instrumentation uh, is required. Instrumentation is essentially a fancy way of scanning screws and rods and hooks. Uh, screw, they've always, spinal surgery has evolved a lot. The initial surgeries where you would use instrumentation were primarily scoliosis surgeries and there were things called Harrington rods that were put in and that were used to help straighten the spines of young people. But as more and more knowledge about spinal deformity has, has come about, we use screws and rods routinely for all manner of spinal conditions, a lot of them degenerative. Uh, and mo the most common one probably is a phenomenon that we see quite a bit of called degenerative spondylolisthesis, which is a problem involving um, back pain, particularly when you're walking. Uh, and a lot of people have it, women a little bit more so than men, and we just see an, a, a tremendous amount of it. And it gets to a point where your, your quality of life with this is so deteriorated, you just can't walk, you can't stand any distance, and so you, you become immobilized by it. You don't really lose strength, but you just don't have, it causes so much discomfort when you're standing that people just prefer to sit and not to be mobile. And, one thing we know about people as they go on in life is that the more mobile you are, the, the longer you do. Exercise is good for you and being active is good for you and sitting in chair or sitting in bed all day long is never a good idea uh, if you're otherwise in good health. And so we, we use a lot of um, screws and instrumentation to do what are called fusions, which are surgeries that 
help stabilize the spine when there's, when there's a, a deformity or when the surgery itself will create what's called instability. And um, one of the challenges of doing those surgeries is always placing the screws and the rods in a configuration where they're not going, they're in bone and not anywhere near the spinal cord or the nerve. And this, these devices called the, uh, we, have, we have a device called the O-Arm 1 and the O-Arm 2. We have two of them actually because we do enough of the surgery to justify having two. And what we do is we will do CAT scans in the middle of a surgery uh, while the patient's asleep and that will give us a, essentially a three-dimensional image of the way the bones and the anatomy of the patient is there configured on the table and our instruments for putting these things in are all linked in and so we have the ability to watch these screws go into bone where we can see everything imaged uh, through computer programs on a, on a screen and that'll, that makes placing screws into the spine far safer and far more accurate than what previously had been done. Previously, it was either you just had to know the anatomy uh, by your ability to recognize what you were looking at and placing this in, or you, you could use an intraoperative x-ray machine, which would go on and off, on and off, because you were constantly checking the what we call the trajectory of your screw, which was fine for a patient, but actually for the surgeons and the team in the operating room, that was exposure to a lot of radiation because if you're doing these surgeries over and over again, every time the patient was getting an x-ray, you were wearing lead, but you were also being exposed. Now with the O-arm, you get one, what's called O-arm spin, you get a three-dimensional model of the patient's spine, either right at the beginning of surgery or after you've done whatever procedure it is, taking out whatever narrowing has been created, and you can go back and put these screws and rods in through this essentially, it's almost like a GPS system, it's linked to the patient's body, and these screws can go in, uh, and it's easier to do, it's safer, so we see a fair bit of traumas here, we get a lot of patients who've unfortunately been in accidents and, and need to have spine stabilization because of spinal fractures, we get a lot of patients who have tumors that have spread to the spine that require stabilization, and unfortunately we see patients with infections that, that will destabilize the spine, and a lot of these involve the thoracic spine, because that's actually the longest part of your spine. And putting in thoracic instrumentation was always a bit of a challenge, because the anatomy is a little bit different than the cervical and in the lumbar spine, the lower upper and lower part. And now with the O-arm, putting in what are called thoracic pedicle screws is, uh, you know, it's actually quite simple uh, because the machine basically tells you exactly where to put your drills, where to put your screws. Uh, and so surgeries that previously would cause a lot of anxiety and would uh, be, you know, somewhat difficult. And sometimes if you had to put, say, eight or 12 screws in, you would look at your x-rays afterwards and realize that two or three of them, two or three of the screws weren't in a position that you would have ideally chosen. Now with this O-arm uh, system that we have at Riverside, we pretty much, that just essentially doesn't happen anymore because it's, uh, once you've used it a few times, it's almost fail safe. Um, so we have that um, technology. We have uh, these very sophisticated OR tables that allow us to position patients in a way that we want their spine to end up when the surgery's done. A lot of people, when they stand, either bend over too much or swing back too much. And so when you're operating on them, you want to put them in a position where their shoulders and their pelvis essentially line up. And we see a lot of people that have these phenomena called flat back syndrome, which is a byproduct of some of the ways that surgeries used to be done 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And we, we I'm sometimes will have to reoperate on these people. As we get older, we all tend to tilt over and that problem can be exacerbated. And we have these sophisticated tables that allow us to position patients in a way which we want them to be when they wake up. Some of the older standard OR tables uh, that we would use for any type of surgery didn't allow you to make those kinds of adjustments. And these tables called Jackson tables have all types of attachments which allow us to configure patients in, in a way that is um, ideal for them when they wake up and then they finally stand back up. Um, so we, we've got that. We've got a team of, of the four of us who pretty much are adept at doing just about any type of spine surgery there is, whether it be for degenerative problems like spinal stenosis and disc herniations, traumatic problems, spinal tumors, um, tumors that are derived from the nerves around the spine, tumors that spread from other parts of the body. Um, we have the ability to do focused radiation on tumors now, what's called stereotactic radiation. So some tumors that actually even 10 or 15 years ago we would do for metastases that were destabilizing the spine that would involve all these the screws and rods and heavy loads of instrumentation. We can now do simple things where we just inject cement 
or do what's called radio ablation, where we actually um, put a radio frequency probe into the tumor, in the bone, in the spine, and using a computer algorithm, we can generate heat that kills the tumor, then inject cement in it. That provides enough stability. Then you do a few days later, you do this conformal type of radiotherapy on a machine called Bavarian Edge. And that can sometimes allow people to take an operation that previously would have taken somewhere between four to eight hours and then probably taken three to six weeks to fully recover from into essentially what is an outpatient operation and they can go home and come back a few days later and have their radiation treatments and get as good a result without having to interrupt their chemotherapy or any other treatments that might be related to their primary cancer or tumor or whatever it is that they're treating. So that has facilitated uh, a lot of folks who are dealing with what are called spinal metastases and we've been using those technologies quite a bit recently substituting smaller, more precise operations for some of the bigger surgeries that previously were required in a scenario like that. And then there's just always the simple problems, the micro, simple disc herniations where people come in with sciatica and what's called lumbar radiculopathy that won't re recover. And we've got all kinds of different, uh, now we do a lot of these surgeries through uh, what are called tubes and you can do uh, we call tubular retractors where you don't actually cut the muscles, you just put in a small little probe and slowly dilate the muscles up and then operate either with an endoscope or a microscope and remove these discs through incisions that are sometimes three quarters to an inch long and obviously the, the advantage to that being one, you're not doing anything to disturb the muscle, but two, you're doing a small incision. So the pain that people have after some of these surgeries can be quite minimal. Uh, and making operations that, again, when I started training, where people stay in the hospital one or two days, outpatient procedures. Um, and then we've done a little bit of what are called disc replacements, not so much in the low back, but in the cervical spine. That is um, a technology that is slowly but steadily gaining momentum, and that involves uh, removing discs in the neck and replacing them with uh, essentially the equivalent of what would be put in for an artificial hip or an artificial knee. Um, up until recently, we would always fuse those people together uh, when we'd have to operate on a disc in the neck if we were operating through the front of the neck. And more recently, uh, studies are showing that the disc replacements are durable and seem to offer a slightly better uh, outcome for a select group of patients. So we're, we're adopting those technologies and using those procedures because those are obviously some younger patients would benefit more from that than from having a fusion. Um, and then we've got a team of other physicians here at Riverside that are sort of dedicated to non-surgical treatments of the spine. We've got um, a couple of physiatrists and pain management specialists that do all manner of injections, uh, uh, transframeal injections, epidural steroid injections, um, blocks of the facet joints and things like that uh, that generally neurosurgeons like myself don't do. But oftentimes when we see patients, uh, if we're seeing them initially, we'll refer them for those types of therapies because obviously not everyone that we see, in fact, not even probably 25% of the people we see as new patients in the office with spine problems ever really need any of these surgeries I've been discussing. Most people just need time, a little physical therapy, maybe some Tylenol or anti-inflammatory, maybe a different exercise regimen, maybe a change in diet, but a lot of spine problems, um, even though we've got all this wonderful technology, never needs to be utilized on them because most people's spine problems are transient, self-limited, they recover, uh, they don't need uh, someone like me um, uh, operating on them, they'll get better on their own. But there's obviously times when that's not the case. Thank you, Dr. McAllister. Um, we had a few questions come in um, from our live stream today, so we're just gonna kinda ask those, go through those right now for, for the folks watching. Um, can you talk a little bit about if, if someone has back problems, is this a safe time considering um, COVID-19 to come in and seek help? Uh, if so, you know, what, who should come in and seek help for their, their back pain? If they have that? I, I think it's, you know, it's a per personal um, preference as to whether you come in or not. It is certainly safe, even though I'm not wearing a mask. When I'm in the hospital, I'm in the office, I'm wearing a mask all the time. I'm washing my hands all the time. Everyone that works in my office, when they come to the office, they have to take, we have to take, we take their temperature. Everyone wears a mask. We have spaced out our appointments. We're working a little bit longer, but we spaced it out so that there won't be overlap of patients in the waiting room. We've put the seats apart. Um, so if you've got a problem that you can't manage at home with Tylenol or Advil or Aleve, and you're, you know, you can't, you're in so much pain that it's affecting your quality of life, or you're weak, 
in your leg or your arm, then I think it's perfectly safe to come to the office as long as you are willing to wear a mask uh, and you're willing to have your temperature checked if you, and, and answer a few questions. If you don't feel well, if you're having a cough and you have a fever, symptoms of COVID-19, then I don't think you should be coming to the office for back problems. You should be going to your PCP or getting tested for coronavirus. But if you're otherwise in good health, which fortunately most of us still remain, um, then yeah, I think it's perfectly safe. In fact, I, I've said this before on one of these Facebook things, but I think you're safer coming to the hospital than you are going to the hardware store or the grocery store. Because unfortunately not everyone is, you know, in Virginia it's not mandatory to wear a mask. It's mandatory when you're on the campus here at Riverside to wear a mask. Um, and we're pretty hyper vigilant about it because we're all healthcare professionals and we realize that this is a bad illness and nobody wants to get it. But on the other hand, we also realize this has been going on for almost two and a half months now. And, you know, other illnesses like spine disorders go on. So, yeah, we've, we've, we, we back, I think we're back doing fully elective surgery as of today. We never really stopped doing spine surgery. We didn't do as much during the shutdown, so to speak, but there are plenty of patients who had problems that where they were progressively having unmanageable pain or they had weakness or they had symptoms of spinal cord dysfunction that were progressive where we continued to do these surgeries during the, during the lockdown. And now we're back to doing things full tilt. Unfortunately, patients, families are still not allowed in the hospital except for with exceptions. But if I did three surgeries this morning and every patient's family, I just simply called once we got to the recovery room because they dropped the patients off. They were short, short surgeries, so the patient's family just waited in the parking lot. But we are trying to limit the number of people in the hospital who may be unknowingly carriers of this virus. But I would, I would say that it's a perfectly fine time to come as long as you're willing to follow all the precautions that I think truthfully we're going to be following for quite some time. So I don't think it's going to change. So I think the new normal is what we're dealing with now until there's a vaccine for this virus. Great, um, another question that came in, would it be possible to talk a little bit more about spinal stenosis, what that means, what that looks like? So spinal stenosis is a condition that can affect any part of the spine, lumbar, cervical, and thoracic, all certainly, certainly more common in the cervical and lumbar spine. And essentially what you have within the spinal column they do the spinal canal through which either the spinal cord or the spinal cord and the nerves associated with the spinal cord travel. So if I just use my hands, you know, you think this is the cross-sectional area and you've got the spinal cord going through. As we get older, some of us accrue arthritis in our spine and that canal starts to narrow. And if it gets to a certain cross-sectional area, you can get symptoms from it in the neck the symptoms can range to, from neck pain to numb arms to stiff legs, trouble walking, clumsiness with your hands, or pain shooting down your arms uh, akin to what people would call a pinched nerve. And your low back, the symptoms are more typical of essentially what you devo initially develop is primarily just low back pain. It's unique though, it's low back pain that gets worse as you walk and as you stand, as opposed to typical low back pain related to just plain old arthritis um, that's back pain that tends to be worse in the morning when you wake up, you're stiff, but if you get moving, get in a hot shower, stretch a little bit, that pain goes away. The pain of spinal stenosis of the low back is unique in that actually typically the more you do, the worse it feels. So the classic thing that someone with lumbar spinal stenosis will say, well, well, I feel okay when I wake up in the morning, but if I'm up and about for too long, I then have to sit down and rest, or if I'm out walking, I find that I have to sit down somewhere and rest because either my back, my buttocks, or my hamstrings, my, the back of my legs will start to tire and fatigue and people will sometimes will feel like they don't get circular, they're not getting circulation. Some people will just describe it as back pain. Some people will get numb legs from it. But inevitably it, it causes it pain that limits your mobility and one of the classic things, they teach you this in the first year of medical school and it is as true as anything, is that one of the classic ways to tell you have spinal stenosis is if you get back pain, particularly if you're at the grocery store, but if you lean over under the grocery cart and you can put your arms down and lean and that can get you to walk farther in the grocery store, that is sort of a classic sign that you've got what's called lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, it's a very common condition and has our population in general ages, we see a significant amount of it. It, it, it runs in correlation with people, the same things that lead to knee arthritis and hip arthritis can lead to lumbar spinal stenosis. And we, we, that's probably in our office the most common condition that we see, uh, more so even than, than herniated disc. We see a lot of lumbar spinal stenosis and so we're pretty adept at dealing with that. And there's a fairly set 
pattern of how you deal with it and what's what what suits people best because it's because it's so common it's been studied a lot so we've got a pretty good handle on how to best deal with that thank you and this is a uh, last question that's come in for for our live stream today can you talk a little bit about scoliosis and what that means and the treatments for that so scoliosis refers to abnormal curvature of the spine the spine has a normal curve when you look at a person from the side in what we call the sagittal plane your neck swings back, your thoracic spine curves forward, and your back arches back. Um, but scoliosis, when we look at people straight on, um, your spine is generally thought should be straight, although truth be told, there's what we call physiological curvature, and so um, up to 10 degrees, we don't get too alarmed. But scoliosis has, um, most notably, if we anyone who grew up you know, most public schools screen in sometime in about late elementary school, junior high school for scoliosis. And the typical, what's called idiopathic scoliosis is essentially the curvature of the spine that you see more frequently in young, young females. Um, and essentially what it is, it's, it's like your spine is corkscrewing. So the spine grows abnormally. Uh, and so when you look at someone from the front, uh, when you look at them from the side, they look okay, generally speaking, but you look at the front and you can see the spine uh, curling. And um, so that's idiopathic scoliosis, which is what most people are familiar with. And um, up until recently, that was kind of the only scoliosis that really mattered. But in the last 20 to 25 years, what we've come to recognize is that degenerative scoliosis or scoliosis in adults who also have spinal stenosis is a big um, problem. And, and, and there's a lot of bad reputation that comes from spine surgery and old people, older folks having surgeries that failed. And I think one of the reasons was that people didn't appreciate the amount of scoliosis that people develop as they age as a byproduct of just wear and tear on the spine. And that device I was talking about, the O-arm, that's one of the things that O-arm helps with because when you've got a spine that's curved, um, you know, so basically what we've learned is that if you, if you fuse people who have scoliosis and who also have nerve compression, they tend to do better than if you just leave them be. Um, and, and don't and just like take away a herniated disc but don't don't address the scoliosis and the o-arm helps us make scoliosis surgery far more far safer because putting in screw one of the reasons people didn't do it is because it was a challenge to put in screws and rods in a spine that was quite curved and now we know a little bit there's been an awful lot of research in what's called spinal balance and we know a lot more about how to preserve spinal balance how to restore spinal balance and so outcomes even from some of our bigger surgeries are, are improved. But scoliosis fundamentally is just a curvature of the spine when you look at someone from straight on. It's like corkscrewing. Most of it you don't have to treat. When, when you're getting screened in junior high school and they have everyone bend over and they say, oh, you know, you've got a little scoliosis and you have to schedule an appointment with your pediatrician, most people when they go see a specialist, they don't have a curvature that requires surgery. Um, and as we get older, you know, people get some people, we see people, some people with some fairly significant scoliosis, but they'll be asymptomatic. And so as you get older, you don't worry about it. But it is a consideration when you're, if you do have to operate on someone for, say, instance, spinal stenosis, and they also have scoliosis, we've now realized that you've got to take that into consideration. You can't ignore the scoliosis and just focus on the symptoms of the spinal stenosis because the scoliosis will affect how their spine will recover from a surgery. So it's important thing to consider, and it's become a more and more uh, of, a, of a crucial part of, of preoperative decision making when it comes to doing spinal surgery. Um, but fundamentally, but that's what we call degenerative scoliosis, and then there, like I said, in young people, it's more of what we call idiopathic scoliosis. But some of what is degenerative scoliosis in life was actually idiopathic scoliosis that people didn't know about, and one of the benefits that we find, you know, you, people are supposed to take vitamin D and keep your bone density up. And that definitely one of the things we see, and unfortunately this is more common in women, is that women, scoliosis is already more common in women to begin with for reasons that aren't clear. But then as women age and they start to have more problems with spinal degeneration and unfortunately also tend to have problems with bone density, is that scoliosis has a more profound effect on females as they get older and they come in and we will occasionally see patients who will have actually quite deformed spines from scoliosis and they'll know it but they won't have ever thought anything need be done and they'll come in for a simple problem but you'll say but it's actually not a simple problem because you've got this scoliosis condition that you've been living with since you were probably 13 years old now you're in your 70s and in order to fix the problem that you thought you had we have to actually think about the scoliosis that you've had your whole life and that does change the dynamics because that turns what would be smaller surgeries into bigger surgeries and some people will you know, easily consent to an operation that might take an hour and a half, but will have hesitation 
and trepidation about doing a surgery that's going to take five, six, seven, eight hours. But in fact, sometimes that longer surgery is the surgery that will serve them the best. But you can't, you don't want to put something, someone through something that they're not, their heart's not in. So, it, but scoliosis is essentially a, a three-dimensional reshaping of the spine, but primarily in what we call the coronal plane, which is when you look at someone from straight on. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. McAllister. Um, and for those who joined on the live stream, we appreciate you tuning in today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Doc Talk Live. Done.